Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, want to, uh, well, there's the title of the talk. I want to thank my, uh, my co-authors who aren't here today, and particularly those from the University of Groningen, uh, who were critical to the last study that I'll be talking about. Uh, thank you for the organizers also for giving me 10 minutes rather than six. <laughs> That's the disclosure. Uh, Unilever paid for it. Unilever paid for me. Um, but the research was carried out by groups independent of Unilever, and I think the only thing that's actually important on here, and actually something which I believe should be an oath uh, signed by all researchers prior to submitting any uh, nutrition intervention studies to journals, are these two points here. The primary and secondary outcomes, the statistical analyses and criteria were all pre-specified in protocols, and the per-protocol analyses were done under a blind uh, review. Uh, the background to this, uh, uh, and the reason we were interested in this, is that uh, flatbreads are a carbohydrate-rich staple, uh, which is an important source of glycemic exposures in, in many Southeast Asian populations. People have looked at alternative starch sources and relatively high addition to fibers uh, to these and found they can have some efficacy for lowering postprandial glycemia and insulinemia. Um, but in addition to finding what else, what might actually be efficacious, I think there's a, a really big issue, and it's come up in a few of the talks here, uh, that when you add these kinds of substantial amounts of viscous fibers or perhaps resistant starches, there are impacts on product quality and acceptance. So finding products, finding what you can add that actually doesn't adversely affect the preparation quality, so in this case it's dough preparation, it's a mix that's, uh, that people prepare at home, the sensory attributes, and especially cost for these populations, I think is, is critical for, for making these feasible. Uh, we looked at uh, predictions from in vitro, but we also wanted to know what is the mode of action? Why do these things have these effects? Uh, so the objectives are here, and uh, really it was focused around what's called, a, it's a wheat-based flour, and, and in India it's called atta, and it's a, as I say, it's a flour that people use for preparing flatbreads at home, in this case chapatis. Um, I'll take you through quickly, uh, and the details of course are in the abstract, uh, through the trials, but for all of these trials, all trials, uh, there was a randomized allocation to treatments. These were all with healthy, non-obese adults. Um, double-blind, uh, all used a within-subject, either a complete or incomplete balanced design, and in all of the studies, subjects were getting three chapatis, so it was 100 grams of flour, uh, and as you'll see, it was about 55 to 60 grams of, of available carbohydrate. We started out by identifying candidate ingredients from the uh, literature and then carried out an exploratory trial, which was only looking at postprandial glycemia. This was done in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, well, uh, incomplete block design, so we used a lot of formulations, and we can be quite creative with incomplete block designs, but each subject only got the control and four other uh, formulations. And this was, and it turns out to be important, I'll come back to the point, it was using uh, capillary uh, blood. This is in, your, uh, is in the abstract, I'm not going to go through the list, but it was various combinations using different levels of a high viscosity, uh, a high molecular weight uh, guar gum, different editions or combinations with chickpea uh, flour and also uh, a couple of editions of konjac uh, man and konjac uh, gum. Um, the market standard atta was included. Now this is a typical product that people would buy. It's milled. It's typically had most of the fiber removed from it. Also, uh, people can buy a high fiber atta where they've added back those fibers and that was our reference. So all of these treatments are compared to this control which can be considered a standard product with some fibers added back. So out of all those, this is the results of that first study, and you can see that four of the uh, treatments clearly not only had a statistically significant effect, but really quite a sizable uh, magnitude of effect on reducing postprandial uh, glycemia. This is the incremental, positive incremental area under the curve uh, for two hours, uh, with reductions of over 30% in, uh, in that two-hour AUC. And these were combinations of two or four percent guar gum with chickpea uh, flour, six uh, percent guar gum alone, or four percent konjac uh, alone. 
Uh, we also measured satiety. We saw no effect. That was an exploratory uh, uh, measure. Uh, those results were reasonably, actually, in, in, at first glance, astoundingly well uh, predicted by, uh, by in vitro parameters from English-type methods and so looking at the parameters, the rate of digestion, the area under the release curve, and the, con and the uh, 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 concentration of carbohydrate, the amount of carbohydrate. Um, later, I was informed uh, that actually the statistician had removed a point, so uh, there was actually an outlier, and the relationship is, is somewhat uh, lower when that outlier was, uh, was included. Uh, the second study, then, uh, we did in India, so this is more of a confirmatory trial with a, the typical population consuming these, where we looked at uh, postprandial glycemia and insulin uh, levels. In between, we selected from the ones that were effective here and tried to optimize those formulations. Um, now, one of the problems, I don't know if anybody's ever consumed a product that had 4% konjac manin or 6% or, uh, guargum in it. Uh, there's somebody there. She's laughing because well, consumers don't laugh. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not very nice, actually. So um, it's not really practicable. Um, there, were, there were problems with it in terms of, of viscosity and cost. And also, we wanted to minimize the amount of guargum. And what we had discovered along the way was surprisingly adding, surprisingly, as they say in patent filings, uh, when you add small amounts of barley flour uh, to this, you can control an off aroma associated with guargum. So there's small amounts of barley flour added. So we took the control from the previous study. We took what we consider to be a positive control from the, perfect, from the previous study, something which was clearly effective, and then had two other trials, one, two other uh, treatments, one using 2 or 3% guargum with small additions, uh, which we don't think are really effective for, for, for these outcome measures but do help with the um, uh, sensory attributes, small amounts of barley flour. Uh, and in this study, as I said, we looked at PPG, also PPI, but used venous uh, blood. And the results are here. This is the, the top here is for, uh, for, for, for glucose. And what you can see is, again, we have uh, certainly for two of the treatments, clearly significant. For all three of the treatments, quite reasonable reductions in postprandial glycemia. But, and I don't know if Alfred Aziz is here, but I hope he's listening, substantially smaller effect sizes when you use venous blood rather than uh, capillary blood, and that's a consistent observation that people have uh, in these kinds of studies. So I think that's an effect of the collection method rather than a difference between populations. Uh, and quite uh, substantial and consistently uh, large uh, reductions and, and statistically significant reductions in postprandial insulinemia with all three of these uh, treatments. And again, satiety was included, and uh, there's no effect on this. And in fact, we never see in many, many studies an effect of variation in postprandial glycemia per se on satiety. Uh, so then we selected from these, and the final study was to look at uh, flux, and I'm pleased that, uh, uh, the, that uh, Professor Lin uh, introduced this concept to start with. Um, it's been spoken about a few times here, which is that postprandial glycemic curves cannot confirm rates of digestion or uptake. It's often an assumption uh, which is made uh, because the glycemic response is, an, is a re result of hepatic production influx from the flu food, in this case uh, chapates, and disposal uh, into uh, tissues. And one can look at this by labeling uh, the food, uh, giving an infusion of tracer amounts uh, of, uh, in this case, 13C for the influx, deuterated glucose for disposal, and you can make some calculations here. Um, and this is what we wanted to do uh, in this study, which was to, to uh, which was the primary outcome was to, the primary uh, outcome measure was to look at the effect on the rates of uptake. So was the addition of this, uh, uh, of this alternative starch source and a viscous fiber, was it really affecting and substantially affecting the rates of uptake in uh, appearance? Again, the same control product, the same positive control, and one of the uh, optimized products, so 2% guar gum, 3% uh, uh, barley. Primary outcome was time to 50% absorption. Uh, we grew wheat in 13 CO conditions uh, to, uh, to get the tracer. We gave a bolus, as I mentioned, of deuterated um, uh, glucose for disposal um, and collected blood over uh, six hours. Um, and first of all, 
just to be sure, we can reproduce the effects of these on reducing postprandial glycemia. So that's the two-hour AUC for glucose. That's the two-hour AUC for insulin. So the things are still effective for reducing postprandial uh, glycemia and insulinemia. But, and rather surprisingly for us, there's clearly, I mean, you don't need to look at the statistical significance, there's clearly a trivial uh, effect on the rates of, of on the time to 50% absorption uh, of uh, uptake of glucose from these products. The rates of, and that's consistent with the rates of appearance, uh, which, are, which are differing, which are trivially different. This, these weren't uh, for planned for statistical analyses, but you can see the 95% confidence intervals. Rate of disposal, also very, very little effect on rates of disposal, and if anything, in the wrong direction, quote unquote. But quite a substantial effect on the rates of endogenous uh, glucose production, where uh, increasing amounts of, uh, of guar gum was associated with quite substantial reductions, uh, as I say, in the uh, rates of endogenous glucose production. We also looked at uh, GYP and GLP-1. We saw some small reductions uh, in GYP with the, with the guar gum treatments and negligible changes in GLP-1. So to conclude, uh, we did find specific combinations of chickpea flour and guar gum, which could be commercially feasible, and I think that's the important point here, commercially feasible routes uh, to reduce PPG and PPI response to, to in flatbreads. Uh, we feel, and others have said this, that the in vitro assays can be very, very helpful and, and maybe given the next, the final point, um, surprisingly uh, uh, helpful in, uh, in predicting uh, the, the effects of these on postprandial glycemia. And surprising, I say, because those assays are actually looking at glucose release. And that's the thing that didn't actually change very much. Uh, in fact, the PPI and PPG lowering effects in this case, we could only find small effects uh, on glucose uptake. And, and actually, the bigger effects were coming probably from post-absorptive effects. So that's what we've done. I'll stop there, and uh, thank you.